We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Okay, Houston, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Uh, Houston, we've had a problem. G'day Space Junkies, welcome back to Space Junk Podcast, the co-video edition, and I am joined live today in his studio, not my studio, by Dr. Jordan Bim, a postdoctoral fellow at Princeton University. Jordan, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks, Amy. And um, how, how are you coping with the COVID lockdown? Well, um, I'm sort of trying to embrace the isolation and confinement as a bit of an analog space mission. Um, unfortunately, I was supposed to be part of a um, uh, analog astronaut crew to the Mars Desert Research Station that was happening in June. Uh, unfortunately, but also wisely, that was canceled. Um, so now instead of pretending to be on Mars in the Utah desert, I'm pretending to be in a little space cabin simulator in my tiny little Princeton studio apartment. Tell me more about that. You were going to go out into the desert and pretend to be on Mars. How does that work? Well, uh, the Mars Desert Research Station is basically a simulation of a Mars habitat in the Utah desert that was founded by the Mars Society in the early 2000s. And different crews of scientists go there uh, all the time for different periods of time and simulate what it's like to live and work on Mars to the point of, uh, you know, if you have to go outside of the, the hab, you have to, you know, pretend to go through an airlock, you have to put on a uh, mock spacesuit, uh, and then you have to, you know, maintain that the whole time you're, you're outside of the hab unit. So, um, as a historian of uh, space exploration, I was added to a crew uh, that's doing uh, astrobi uh, astrobiology studies. And the name of the mission was supposed to be Martian Biology 2. And I was really looking forward to assisting and also studying these astrobiologists in their sort of simulated Mars um, work there. But uh, unfortunately, it has been canceled very understandably so. And hopefully it will be rescheduled uh, at some point in the future. And I'll have a chance to do that then. I hope so. I'm sure it will be. And so your plan was to basically be a plant within this setup in the, in the desert and you were going to be studying the people you were living with. Is that right? Exactly. Yeah. My, my, um, the project we'll be most focused on today is, is my work on the history of astronauts, but my, my current research project is on the history of astrobiology. So I was really looking forward to having a chance to work alongside present day astrobiologists and their Mars simulations, and then add that to my uh, research on some of the very, very first Mars simulations from the 1950s. That sounds phenomenal. Now, I think we need to ask you more about your research. So you said you were looking at Mars simulations from early on, but what else do you do? So um, the, the book I'm currently revising, which hopefully will be out next year, uh, is called Anticipating the Astronaut. And it's a very early history of the astronaut. And a lot of histories of the astronauts will, or the astronaut will start with the Mercury 7, NASA's first astronaut team that was selected in 1959. Um, but I decided it would be more interesting to look at that group as sort of the end of the story and instead follow the decade of research that happened not within NASA, but within the U.S. Air Force, uh, starting in the immediate post-war moment after World War II, where they did a whole bunch of studies and simulations aimed at sort of building up the astronaut. And they employed this wide range of really diverse models for the astronauts. So not the, the sort of um, test pilot engineer that we sort of associate now with the early astronaut. Instead, they were using uh, different types of people like non-flying um, soldiers. They were using also uh, high altitude indigenous people from Peru. Uh, also women pilots were used as well as mountaineers and even monkeys and chimpanzees as well served as models for the astronauts. So this early pre-NASA history of the astronaut kind of um, highlights some of the contingencies um, and the historicity around the astronaut and kind of makes us think about who should be an astronaut, how did it come to be that this type of person that NASA ended up selecting was the right kind of person for space in the first place, and maybe sort of opening up uh, our sort of imagination of who we can send to space in the future to make it a bit more diverse and a bit more open. That is absolutely fascinating. So you say there was a decade of this research. What sort of things were they doing in the research? Were they taking these astronauts and sort of plonking them in habitats for long periods of time? And, and how did that turn out? I'm, I'm so interested. I want to read the book, but I'd like the sneak peek. Sure. Well, um, they were doing exactly what you said. Um, the first chapter of the book deals with this really uh, horrific machine called the Space Cabin Simulator, where 
they would basic they basically created this um, really small, tight, confined, isolated environment, uh, basically like a, a metal box. And they selected these poor, hapless, um, you know, very young non-pilot soldiers and put them inside on these simulated space missions where they couldn't speak to anybody uh, in the outside world for an entire week. They had to live inside this tiny little confined box where they had to perform simulated work for uh, you know um, days and days and days on end. Um, and you know that was that was the very first simulation of a space flight. We think of you know uh, NASA astronauts training for space and space cabin simulators. Well, the story of the very first space cabin simulator shows us a very different um, version of the astronaut, not one that was this experienced and seasoned pilot, but one that actually wasn't expected to be a pilot at all, and that was more sort of this Cold War push button soldier, more of the kind of uh, soldier that you would find in a radar station or a missile silo. Um, so that was sort of the very earliest uh, version of the fleshed out, uh, you know, a human playing the role of astronaut. Another thing they did was they did the first uh, analog mission to an analog space environment. And these are uh, all different kinds of environments on Earth that we think sort of have some sort of quality of outer space. Today, astronauts train in, in all kinds of analog environments, including underwater habitats, uh, deep caves, um, uh, the desert research station like I was going to go to. But the very first one of these uh, was an Air Force um, uh, experiment called the Mount Evans Acclimatization Experiment, where in 1958, seven men went up to the very top of uh, one of uh, the highest peaks in the Colorado Rockies called Mount Evans. And up there, they tried to live and train themselves to be more oxygen efficient in the very thin mountain air, with the idea being that the uh, pressure inside a space capsule would have to be sort of lower than normal. And they wanted to see how, how low a human, how low pressure a human could tolerate. And what's really interesting about that story is that these Air Force um, subjects that were taken up the mountain, um, their proficiency in the, the low pressure environment wasn't being compared to, you know, test pilots. It was actually being compared to high altitude indigenous people from Peru who were being studied by these, uh, you know, former Luftwaffe doctors under very questionable circumstances. So that is a whole other chapter to this very early, very um, interesting prehistory of the NASA astronaut. Absolutely. And so then what does it say about us as, well, I guess, what does it say about America that the astronauts that ended up being selected for the Mercury program were that kind of very white, all-American um, macho hero that you see? And I, I'm leaning heavily here on the film The Right Stuff. Um, so feel free to tell me whether that is or isn't at all accurate. But I, I guess when you look at the way that they were presented to the public, do you think that's driven more by politics than anything else? Or, or was it that these, this type of man was considered to be what you needed for an astronaut? Well, it, it turns out that, you know, um, who was seen as right for space and, and what sort of the ideal spacefaring body and mind was at the time didn't actually reflect sort of just the hazards of space flight or, or what it would take to survive a space mission. It reflected all these social and political values that were at the fore of the early Cold War period, um, proficiency with science and technology, um, military uh, status and allegiance, uh, loyalty, reliability, all these different things were sort of embodied by these, um, you know, um, middle career, um, uh, you know, mil uh, military test pilots with degrees in engineering, uh, which, which was what all the early astronauts were. That is incredibly fascinating. And the film, The Right Stuff, do you think it's accurate? It, it, uh, obviously, it is a work of, of art. And I don't think um, movies about space should be striving for 100% accuracy. That's a problem that I have with a lot of um, space enthusiasts and their reception of space movies is they, they seem to have this fetishization for total accuracy. And uh, I, I prefer to see uh, accuracy to emotion and character and narrative, um, that sort of thing when I, when I go to the movies. But that being said, you know, the right stuff really does, um, you know, uh, bust a number of those myths that were created in the 1960s by NASA and attendant publications like Life magazine that painted this sort of Boy Scout image of the early astronaut, which of course wasn't, wasn't true. Um, and Tom Wolfe does a, a good job of kind of exploding that myth by highlighting some of the very reckless and um, you know, less than um, ideal behavior that many of these astronauts engaged in, as well as their heroic and brave uh, feats of being launched into space. I think that's a really good point. I often feel the same when people criticize movies like, I mean, Star Wars, for example, for having inaccurate physics 
I think, yeah. wait, like you're criticizing a movie that has Ewoks and Wookiees and is clearly a science fiction fantasy world for the fact that the gravity depicted like with this spaceship isn't quite right. That seems to me to be um, a little bit strange, but it is weird, isn't it? How we kind of, there is that move to push for movies like Interstellar, for example, to be totally accurate. And I think maybe the reason there's that push is because it gets so nearly there. It is accurate in so many yeah. ways. But as you say, you don't want to lose the, I guess, the story of the human in the midst of all of the technology. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Why, why do we go to the movies? We don't go to the movies to see um, a 100% recreation of reality. <laughs> you know, we, we go there to learn something and to experience something. And to do that oftentimes requires sacrificing accuracy here and there. And if you do want to criticize, you know, the accuracy of physics and astronomy, there are tons of lectures on YouTube that you can watch. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Not to mention basically all science communication. Yeah, exa exactly, totally. Yeah, nothing is ever going to be perfectly accurate because it's all a representation mm. and representations are representations. Yeah. There's your philosophy for the morning from the philosopher <laughs> of science. Um, <laughs> Isn't that valuable? So that, then what I'm hearing is, so you are basically an expert in or a historian of, I shouldn't use the word expert because it makes people nervous, a historian of the astronaut as a concept and the astronaut as this kind of embodiment of social structures, political structures and ideologies of a particular time. Correct? It, correct. And, and to nail down, just to drill down a little bit further, um, I really deal with the history of a field called space medicine and uh, the sub-discipline of space psychology within that. And I really focus on the pre-NASA period, which a lot of people don't even realize was a thing. They think that the, the creation of NASA and the selection of the Mercury 7 was the creation of the astronaut, when in fact that had been an ongoing process for a whole decade before NASA existed um, within the United States Air Force and a little bit within the U.S. Navy as well mostly run by uh, doctors who came over from the, the Luftwaffe after World War II. So there's definitely a lot of politics about the body uh, to uh, unpack there and nationalism and all that stuff. That is spectacular. I am so thrilled about this, um, this book when it comes out. I can't <laughs> wait to read it. And I'm sure that many of the viewers and listeners will feel the same way. Thank but you. I want to get on to the Outer Space Treaty. So Jordan has selected Article 5 of the Outer Space Treaty, which I think was a good choice given that it's the one that deals with astronauts. Um, and I thought that I would read it, I think I will read it in its entirety and then throw to you for comments and we can go from there. How about that? Right. Sounds great. Okay. Article 5. Forgive the Australian accent, by the way. I know it's like quite horrendous, but at least it sounds cheerful, apparently. States parties to the treaty shall regard astronaut, astronauts as envoys of mankind in outer space and shall render to them all possible assistance in the event of accident, distress, or emergency landing on the territory of another state party or on the high seas. When astronauts make such a landing, they shall be safely and promptly returned to the state of registry of their space vehicle. In carrying on activities in outer space and on celestial bodies, the astronauts of one state party shall render all possible assistance to the astronauts of other states' parties. States' parties to the treaty shall immediately inform the other states' parties to the treaty or the Secretary General of the United Nations of any phenomena they discover in outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, which could constitute a danger to the life or health of astronauts. So that is Article 5. Jordan, your initial thoughts? Well, I think it's really important to remember the context in which this was all drafted. Um, you know, so the Outer Space Treaty, obviously 1967, um, you know, the height of the Cold War. Uh, a lot of the articles from the treaty had been in the works since the early 1960s at the UN. And when it comes to, you know, framing the astronaut as, as this envoy for all, all mankind, that's a really sort of naive characterization of what was going on and who these people were. It masks so many elements of the astronaut. It masks their nationalism, their national, their national allegiance, their military character. The fact that the missions that they were on weren't sort of these, um, you know, uh, just benign explorations for science and progress. They were actually very serious, you know, national security and geopolitical uh, missions that had very heavy significance in those areas. So um, when I hear that um, this, 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 this um, 
uh, terming them as the envoy for all mankind, um, you know, I, I really see like a bit of an elision there. And, and the reason why this is happening, it's no surprise. And I think a little bit of a historical um, context can help us understand what's going on here. So, you know, uh, space missions at this time were not the only thing happening high up in the atmosphere. Um, of course, you know, NASA was founded in 1958, Mercury 7 were selected in 1959, first human space flights occur in 1961. But what happens right in between 1959 and 1961, high up in the atmosphere that would maybe be, um, you know, somewhat on the minds of people thinking about recovering and returning people? Well, it was the 1960 U-2 spy plane incident in which uh, a U.S. CIA pilot, Francis Gary Powers, was shot down over the Soviet Union at super high altitude while trying to take photographs of uh, Soviet military installations. Um, he was not just returned to his country of origin. He was imprisoned. He was um, accused, you know, accurately of committing espionage. He was put on a giant show trial in front of the world, embarrassing the United States. He was convicted of espionage and imprisoned uh, until 1962 when he was swapped in a prisoner exchange for um, uh, a Soviet agent in, in America. So uh, no one wanted to see this happen to a Yuri Gagarin or a John Glenn, should they land in the Soviet Union or the United States or vice versa. No one wanted to see um, these public figures or you know, in the case of the American astronauts, these celebrities become prisoners of the Cold War. So this, this sort of golden rule of you know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, if, you know, our astronaut lands in your territory or yours and ours, um, we're going to consider them an envoy of all mankind. We're not going to consider them a spy or a soldier or, um, you know, some, someone to be dealt with in the manner of Francis Gary Powers or some of the other um, pilots who were shot down on reconnaissance flights. Um, you know, I think that speaks to this, this um, sort of benign, naive understanding of space. Space flight is divorced from the Cold War or as sort of this utopian vision of spaceflight is not being bound up in these sort of geopolitical things. So uh, I think what this language kind of uh, gets us to think, uh, think deeply about is the way that an astronaut might have been a pawn, a geopolitical pawn if it was captured by um, an opposing power, or uh, the way an astronaut could have been seen as a geopolitical liability or a national security liability should they be interrogated by the KGB as Francis Gary Powers was. Yeah, I think that that's a really fascinating perspective. So this idea that rather than being this kind of high-minded, um, what's the word for it where you're, I don't know. Anyway, rather than that, instead, this is a very pragmatic article that is trying to manage risk on both sides. Because, of course, this had to be agreed, and it was agreed by the USSR and the USA at the time. And so if you have something so pragmatic, as this, it makes it much easier for everyone to sign on to it because basically by agreeing to treat each other's astronauts as these sort of lofty people, it means that both sides manage that risk. And I suppose the other angle to this is that both sides know that whatever happens to, with these astronauts, the world's attention will be watching. And so you've got that, that relationship between I guess the the state and its astronaut, but also the state and its people and that astronaut. Is that something you would see as a thing that had affected the, the way this is put together? I'm just I'm just thinking about the history, and I know that these astronauts were really public figures. So the way that the general public saw them might have been affected too. What do you think? Sure, I mean, yeah, the astronauts were were always seen as sort of above and beyond, sort of the regular thing and, and their military status was downplayed dramatically. So the idea that they would want them to be treated with very special treatments, uh, almost like a sort of diplomatic immunity or something like that, um, you know, it, 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 makes, it makes sense. At the same time, the, the Outer Space Treaty was an attempt to sort of create a set of norms and, um, you know, sort of idealized, uh, agreed upon um, um, actions in advance before something bad happened. And a lot of a lot of sort of the Cold War was about sort of managing, uh, you know, these the potential for a flashpoint in advance. You know, um, after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the installation of the the red phone in uh, in in both leaders' um, offices. You know, we can see this as sort of a cope ahead plan. You know, what what would happen if 
um, a Soviet cosmonaut accidentally landed in Kansas, you know? <laughs> what, mm -hmm. what would happen if uh, a Project Mercury astronaut, you know, found themselves uh, in the middle of China or um, some other country which was not necessarily, you know, friendly to the United States in the way that they would just return this potentially very valuable person who had very valuable information about lots and lots of classified, um, you know, uh, materials. And, you know, let's not forget the Cold War was all about information. It was all about intelligence and trying to know about what your uh, what the other side was doing. So the capture and interrogation of an astronaut would be like an incredible mother load of information. Mm. Um, but neither side wanted it to happen. So this, I think, you know, can be seen as a bit of a cope ahead plan. So let's agree in advance that should this thing happen, which would be bad for either one of us, let's agree that there is this sort of shared set of norms right off the bat that we're just going to give that person back right away and, you know, uh, carry on from there. I'm also really interested by the wording around when they're doing your activities on, say, on celestial bodies. So that's planets, moons, mm -hmm. uh, asteroids, etc. In this case, I think everyone was referring to the moon. But when you're carrying out that kind of activity, the idea that one state party's astronauts will render all possible assistance to the other, I find that very interesting as well. It's this kind of codification of an idea of altruism and mm -hmm. as you say the envoys of mankind and i'm reminded of the words one small step for man one giant leap for mankind which were then juxtaposed so jarringly as as an aussie watching with the planting of the american flag on the moon and so or the I, ongoing war in vietnam at the same time you know like <laughs> sure yeah i mean say more <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, that, that again is another one of those sort of utopian rhetorics that, um, you know, just has nothing to do with the reality of the situation. It was trying to create sort of this idealistic notion that what was happening there was really for everybody and that those, you know, 12 white military men somehow represented all of humanity, <laughs> which is, is sort of laughable when you think about it. Um, so in, in terms of rendering support on, on the moon, you know, Obviously, only Americans have ever made it to the moon uh, so far, so there wasn't ever uh, a case where there needed to be aid rendered in space. And so far, there has never been the need for a rescue in space, although um, the loss of the Space Shuttle Columbia in 2003 did create the uh, contingency plan for uh, NASA to develop its Launch on Need program, which uh, imagined the uh, quick um, readying and launch of a second space shuttle to um, retrieve the crew of a stranded uh, shuttle that maybe could not re-enter due to damage or something like that. Um, you know, but, but these, the, you know, th these um, uh, problems have been imagined in, in science fiction. And uh, if you watch uh, National Geographic's recent, uh, you know, docudrama, I think it's called Mars, just Mars, it imagines the, the establishment of a, of a, a Mars colony. Um, one thing that develops is this sort of competing colonies. You have the, the National Space Agency colony, but then you have the, the private space colony as well. And there is tension between the two in terms of how they would render aid to each other were there to be some sort of need for that. So I don't want to have any spoilers about the plot or anything like that. But uh, this idea of, you know, uh, at what point would you risk your um, resources and crew uh, to aid uh, basically a competitor or someone who is not part of your, you know, uh, discrete group. Uh, that comes into play. So uh, this is definitely um, an attempt to sort of uh, codify that, at least to some extent, in advance of that problem happening. And I think it's also important to note, too, that uh, Article 5 was actually expanded upon one year later in what's called the Rescue Agreement, mm. uh, which was sort of this um, another uh, article or another uh, treaty that the, uh, the same nation signed on to, which just sort of tried to sharpen and... Um, uh, make a bit more definite some of the terms from Article 5. So uh, Article 5 describes the, the, the astronaut as the, the subject of, uh, of, uh, of the aid. But of course, the, they quickly imagined other types of people uh, being involved in spaceflight who might not be considered you know, to be astronauts. There is a huge open question about who is considered an astronaut and who is not. Um, you know, very narrowly defined, an astronaut could be someone who is selected by NASA or a National Space Agency and receives spaceflight training and then is hired as sort of a career astronaut, as opposed to someone like a space tourist or a spaceflight participant or a payload specialist like uh, NASA was flying back in the 1980s on the space shuttle. Uh, 
So the language was updated to include uh, what they called personnel of a spacecraft, which uh, tried to cast a wider net than just, you know, than just straight up only, you know, astronauts from the National Space Agency. Yeah, and if you are interested and you haven't read the rescue agreement, or if you're just, you know, you just want to go go and have a, a revision, then I have a video which will be up um, adjacent to this video, let me think, maybe that side, where <laughs> I sit down and read the entirety over a cup of tea for you. So you can sit down and listen to it being read in an abrasive Aussie accent, which I think, you know, in this time of lockdown, is there any better activity than the reading of space law? I think not. I'm really interested, though, in bringing this forward to today. And as you mentioned, there's that distinction between someone who goes to space as a space tourist and someone who is a true astronaut. And I find this really fascinating because in terms of Article 5, I guess it, it makes a difference. You know, for example, if uh, I don't know if you've been watching Avenue 5, Amanda Iannucci's new work about the people stuck on a spacecraft as space tourists and so on. Well, no, I should. Clearly. You must. Um, it's very odd. Anyway, there's but there's obviously this idea, like if you have a spaceship that's full of people who are just there as tourists, are they the envoys of all mankind? Surely that can't be in line with the intention of this article. But it does actually become relevant in a way that I hadn't thought it would. When I was at IAC last year, there were a couple of very prominent astronauts present. And there's this almost religious reverence of them. They're mm -hmm. worshipped. They're not just envoys of mankind. They're like key religious figures for a lot of people who grew up watching the moon landing on TV, like Buzz Aldrin and so on. And, and we worship them in the sense that when they stand on stage, we like applaud for hours and give them standing ovation after standing ovation. But also in the sense that there are kind of relics of astronauts in the space suits and the gloves. And I had the opportunity to put a space glove on. And I, I felt this feeling of like, oh my God, it's magical, it's been to space. And of course, that's all a social construction as well. But there's a yep. huge difference in the way that these astronauts and their relics are treated in this religious way compared to people who've gone to uh, on like one of the Virgin galactic flights and then say oh i've technically been to space it's a really different vibe what's going on here why like what's this religious thing that we've got so we like to think of space as something that's very separate from where we are we think of it as a separate realm rather than something that's continuous um and that's where constructions like the, the carmen line come into play um and we do have this idea it, it's basically just a swapping out of the old ideas of the heavens for the new idea of the heavens uh, like you mentioned, there's sort of a religious um, awe surrounding these humans that have been there and come back. Um, but I think what, like, one of the things that I try and do as a historian is sort of problematize and defamiliarize some of these utopian notions that have taken hold. And to see space rather, rather than see space as this sort of transformative utopian place where things go and change radically, uh, rather, space is actually a place where all of the problems, all of the inequities on Earth are reproduced. And if not just reproduced and amplified, um, you know, and I think that the, uh, the narratives of transform, transformation, utopian uh, narratives, they really mask uh, what was actually a very dystopian Cold War project to militarize outer space with these, you know, military personnel or military adjacent uh, science scientists, parts of, part, uh, you know, representatives of the military industrial complex. So I think there is actually a utopian vision for space still out there, but we haven't quite got there yet. And uh, what I hope that my research does a little bit uh, uh, of is, you know, begins the project of trying to reimagine what that might look like uh, rather than sort of the, the Cold War vision, which we're still very much living inside of as the reverence for the, uh, the, the space race astronauts shows. Jordan, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. I feel that we should wind up and I think that's a really nice place to finish. Um, but I wanted to ask, do you have any recommendations for people stuck inside on their sort of mission to Mars analog in their own home? I do. And I think that like this, this moment, this moment of pandemic is actually a really good time to think about uh, Article 5, especially because Article 5 deals with this theme that all astronauts deal with is that once you are launched, you are always trying to get home again. And Article 5 is really just trying to get people home. 
And this pandemic has sort of made that an issue for so many people around the world um, trying to make it back. And I, I think there's a, a very uh, paralleling of that theme to, to current events. But if you are uh, like me and uh, like most of the world stuck in, inside right now and looking for some good space stuff to watch, I would highly recommend revisiting uh, the HBO miniseries from the Earth to the Moon, which aired in the 1990s. Uh, Tom Hanks produced it after he made Apollo 13. Um, different episodes recount each of the Apollo missions to the moon. And they're just, they're really wonderful. They, they do have a high degree of, of that accuracy we talked about before, but they also have a sort of fun uh, quality to them and a sort of cinematic magic, which uh, makes them really, really rewatchable. And if I'm ever homesick or, or um, when I had my wisdom teeth out and I couldn't go outside for a couple of days, I sort of binge watched that series and that was great. Um, in terms of themes of isolation and confinement, which are so at top of mind for everyone right now, um, I would suggest, you know, if you are cooped up with another person and you want to sort of get the other side of things, I would, I would recommend watching The Martian to see how bad it would be to be totally alone. Uh, and if you are uh, totally alone like me, I would recommend maybe watching um, the horror movie The Lighthouse from last year by Robert Eggers with uh, Robert Pattinson and William Dafoe, uh, which is, it's sort of, uh, you know, um, tells the tale of these two lighthouse keepers who are totally isolated on this very remote sort of space analog 19th century lighthouse and drive each other totally insane. So, um, you know, depending on if you are alone or with another person and looking to, um, you know, maybe think about how bad it would be to be in the other situation, those two movies could provide some catharsis right now. Fantastic recommendations. I'll definitely be checking those out. And in terms of your own research, if people want to read more, uh, look you up, get in contact, what's the best way to do that? Um, you know, I, you can Google my name, Jordan Bim. Um, I have a number of articles online that are very easy to find. Um, one of them deals with um, historicizing this concept of the overview effect, which I, I think has a major place in that sort of um, romanticization and um, a religious aspect of spaceflight. Um, and that article kind of deconstructs it and looks at some of the, the Cold War historical um, uh, precursors to the overview effect to kind of make people rethink that whole concept. So I would recommend people check that out if they have time. Fantastic. Thank you so much. It's been amazing to talk to you. And I hope that the rest of your lockdown goes very smoothly. Thanks so much for having me on the show and for uh, thinking of this really awesome series. No worries. <laughs>